Hello, this video is to serve as a resource for Science Olympiad coaches in North Carolina for the Invasive Species event. I'm Lara Pacifica. I'm faculty in Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology in the College of Natural Resources at North Carolina State University, and I'll be helping with the event this year. This video will go through some basics of invasive species, what students should know about invasive species in general, um, the event format for this year's event, and a few example questions. So students should know the general definition of invasive species and understand that in different contexts a single species could be considered an invasive species in one area or in one situation but in not another area. So examples, European honeybees, while they're non-native and in some cases prolific, their benefit outweighs the harm so they are not considered invasive. English ivy is considered invasive here in North Carolina, uh, but in the Midwestern states of the United States, they um, they don't outcompete the native species to the extent that they do here, so they are not considered invasive there, but they are here. And then just because a species outcompetes other species doesn't necessarily mean that it's invasive. White-tailed deer, in a lot of cases, outcompete other species, but they're native, so they are not considered invasive. Invasive species are always non-native, but there are some non-natives that are not invasive. So rainbow trout, for example, are not native to North Carolina, but they're also not invasive. They don't outcompete um, the all native species, so they're not invasive. And then domestic species cannot be domestic animals won't be considered invasive. And so kind of an interesting example of this is feral hogs. So feral hogs, if they're out in the wild, they are invasive. They out compete, they create a ton of damage, um, they have very high reproductive rates, but if they're domesticated, if they're kept at a farm, those animals on the farm are not considered invasive because they're under human control. Students should be uh, familiar with the general life history traits of invasives. Most invasive species are generalists, so they don't have very specific life history needs. Uh, they generally have few natural predators or competitors in their non-native environment. They may have them in their native environment. They generally have a high reproductive rate, high dispersal success, and oftentimes they're pioneer or early successional species. So for this year's event, it'll be similar to last year's uh, event where there's 20 stations. Students will have two minutes at each station, and each station could have any of the following live specimens. If they're live, it's probably going to be a plant. Um, for most of the animals, I don't think they will have live specimens. We may have preserved specimens or um, like skins or skulls um, or mountings of um, of specimens. We could have photos. We may also have data or graphs and I have an example question with an example of that. Students are allowed to have a binder that includes fact sheets for each species and the rules. So in general students should know the identification, the mode of introduction and invasion of each species, the region of origin, in the current distribution, life history characteristics, the damage that's caused, and the native species that are affected, and the mode of control, and whether it's been successful or not. And then, again, students should be able to critical, critically think about data related to the species. And like I said, I have an example of that to show you. So some of the information in this presentation came from the National Invasive Species Council um, white paper on invasive species and that reference is listed here. It's a good reference um, for students to explore as well. 
My contact information is listed here also, and you should feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And now for a few example questions. This um, picture here depicts the scientific name of this is Seuss scrofa. So this is a feral hog, wild pig. Um, there's lots of common names, but the scientific name is Seuss scrofa. Uh, how was it introduced in North Carolina? It was imported as a food store, so it was brought over as a domestic animal and escaped um, or was released. And that happened, um, it's believed, uh, in the 1500s. And the name for the foraging habit that creates damage and has a negative ecological impact, that's called rooting. The average litter size is four to six. Question two, the common name. This is a zebra mussel. The scientific name is Dresena polymorpha. The most common mode for this species to spread from one body of, an, of water to another is on boats, so they'll attach to a boat. The boat gets taken out of one body of water, brought to another, and they'll release in the next body of water. This organism outcompetes native species because um, native aquatic mussel species require uh, a parasitic larval phase, so for their larva to reach maturity, they have to be parasites on the gills of fish, and so it's, a, it's just a more specific life history characteristic. It's, it's dependent on another species, whereas the zebra mussels don't need that, um, so reproduction is um, easier, so to speak, for them, and, and they have higher rates of reproductive success than the native species. And now this is the uh, example question that relates to, um, to data on an invasive species and requires some critical, critically, some, sorry, critical thinking. Uh, the Argentine ant isn't actually on this year's list, but I, I like this question just for the um, kind of the format of it. So students could expect to have a question like this, but for a different species. So the native range of the Argentine ant is South America. They're now found everywhere except Antarctica. Um, they they spread through shipping. Um, they think on either either coffee or sugar. So again, those types of questions would be typical for um, questions of the species that are on this year's list. And then the final question, examine the graph to the right. The odorous house ant is native to the U.S. Argentine ant is not native. Would the Argentine ant be considered invasive in areas where temperatures were consistently below freezing for several days at a time? So if you look at the graphs, you see that the more, um, well, the colder the temperature is, the quicker the survival drops off. So at 4 degrees Celsius, the Argentine ant uh, makes it about 8 days, but then as the temperature decreases, they're only surviving um, three or four or five days. And so the Argentine ant wouldn't be able to survive for several days below freezing at a time. Um, it's definitely not better than the native ant. And so they would not be considered invasive in areas where you have these longer durations of freezing temperatures. And when you look at the range map for an Argentine ant, they don't go much above North Carolina. They don't go much farther north because of that, because in areas where there's extended periods of cold um, temperatures, they're not going to survive. And so it's that temperature that limits their, their range. So students should be able to, to take graphs like this and, and answer questions where they have to think about about um, ideas like this one. 
So thanks for taking the time to listen to this. Again, if you have any questions about the test, about the species, about the format, I'm happy to talk about them. My email is lara underscore pacifica at ncsu.edu. Good luck to you and all of your students, and I'm excited to see you in the spring. Thanks.